Thank you, guys. That's great. It's good to praise the Lord, isn't it? It's good to be saved. Is it good to be saved? Jack, thanks for coming today. Great to see you. Glad you're here, Jack. You're, you're a real encouragement to me by being here. Praise the Lord. And you, Carol. Praise the Lord. Anyway, let's come and pray. Father, we thank you for your, uh, for your these songs, these songs, Lord, that are all about you, lifting your name up on high. Lord, we know we can't lift you up higher than you already are, because you're already the King of Kings, King over all kings on this earth, and you're the Lord of Lords. But Lord, we just praise you, and we just want to magnify you in our life and in our praise, to say that you are the creator of the heaven and earth, because we know in your word it says all things were made by you and for you, and in you all things exist. Can't get my head around that, but Lord, we praise you for it. Lord, I just pray for myself now, Lord, as I minister your word. I pray, Father, would you use me in my weakness? I pray, Lord, that you would remove all fear. I pray, Lord, that you would re remove all distractions. And Lord, give us an atmosphere, a, a freedom in this place, Lord, to minister your word. Lord, may people be uh, receptive to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Who remembers last, last week? We're going to do something different this week because last week we were going starting to go through the play. Does anyone remember what it was? Graham Hadfield was preaching. We started off with the first three plates. Can anyone remember what they were? Frogs. You know that because she always puts a frog on the end of her text messages. <laughs> Frogs. Blood in the Nile. Oh, there's one more. Testing it out. Nats. Make sure you bring your notepads next time. Nats. It was Nats, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But what I spoke to Graham afterwards, I thought, we're going to be in this forever if we go through these plagues one at a time. So what we're going to try and do is wrap up the plagues today. But I'm going to start from the beginning, just an overhaul of them, so you can see what they all were. Because otherwise I think we're going to get lost and confused. I think it would be good to do it one here, so we can understand what was God doing? Why was he doing it? Yeah. So we, we, first of all, we're going to see God's purpose in all this. Yeah? His purpose we'll talk about in a minute. His power that is displayed, his wonders, his majesty. Yeah? And then we're going to be talking about his protection over his people. And then his plan for us, the church, really, where Jesus being the Passover lamb. So I've used five Ps. So a right bit of alliteration today. That means all words with the same letters. Okay, just so we know where we're going, and maybe you'll be able to take that home. I don't usually do it that way, but we're going to do it. So first, we're not even going to start in the Bible. I've got some scriptures, because if we start in the Bible, we'll be in there. that would be most of the sermon taken up by reading it. So we're doing it this way. I hope that's okay. Yeah, so first off, God has a purpose, yeah? And we know that it, all throughout, if you read Exodus 7 to 10 or 11, it says that they may know that what? I am the Lord. That's his purpose here. His purpose is one, for, for, for instance, the Hebrews were probably, they knew they had a faith, but they didn't think that God really was there. They didn't think he was capable of freeing them. So one, to know that, that he is there for them, and also that the Egyptians may know that he is the Lord. Yeah? And we know from here, if you read this, in 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, it says, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires, this is lovely, who desires all people to be saved. That's everyone. Okay? And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? The truth we have is the Gospel of Christ, obviously, His Word in the Holy Bible. Yes, yeah, so God wants all people to be saved. He wants to bring His people out of Egypt. And He's going to do it, whether the Egyptians like it or not. Okay? So first is His purpose. Next is His power. Now, you could see the Hebrews, uh, and all throughout the world, there was sin in the world. We know uh, from the prophecy in Genesis 15, where he talks about, um, he gives them a prophecy that the, the, his people will be rescued out of Egypt. But he said the Amorites, the sin of the Amorites has yet to be complete before I can judge them until you go back into the promised land. All right? So there's lots of sin in the world, and he's had enough. God has said, enough is enough. Yeah, but there's also idolatry. You know, Egypt was just absolutely riddled with false god worship. Yeah, we can see that today, can't we? People worshiping all sorts of things but God of Israel. 
So God is going to display His power. He's going to display His wonders, yeah? And we can see through the, through the Exodus that Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened. God hardens his heart, yeah? His heart just gets hardened. Either way, his heart becomes getting harder and harder and harder. And I think that's God saying, okay, look, I'm going to show you. And then it leads up to the Passover at the end, which is a, is a foreshadow of Christ. So first we're going to start with God turning the Nile into blood. Okay, can you see that on the screen? You probably can't see it very well. I'm not sure if turning the lights off, off are going to make much difference. <laughs> but we're getting our projector next time I preach, so it'll be good, it'll be a lot brighter. You can see here, God told Moses to go down to the Nile, yeah, where Pharaoh is, and turn the water into blood. Now in a sense you can see that the Nile was the source of life to Egypt. They drank from it. It probably went in about eight miles into the mainland and there was vegetation and farmland. But it was a source of life. It was, it was their lifeline. Without that, they wouldn't even be there. Okay. So first off, what God is going to do, one by one, He's going to start destroying and humiliating the false gods of Egypt. One being Hapai. I mean, I know Graham mentioned these gods. Hapai, who was the, uh, supposed to be the god of the Nile. And then we have Isis, who was the goddess of the Nile. But there was one called Arasis, I call Osirisis, I think it's called, uh, he's called. His blood was supposed to be the source of the Nile. And every time it used to flood, they used to think that it was like the, the rebirth of this god, okay? So first off, God is going to destroy the Nile. And what happened, he turned it into blood. It wasn't just a river, it was every water. Wherever they went, it was just blood. You can imagine the fish were dead, and it really stank. And what they were doing, what did they do? They were trying to build trenches near the river to try and get water. Okay, so that's the first one. Second one, the frogs. The frogs. This is his second judgment. I know that uh, Graham preached on this last week, but we're just going to give a quick overview of it. Did you know frogs were sacred to the Egyptians? I'm glad you're not in Rosemary, I got that right. <laughs> they were sacred. Yeah, and there was this goddess, her, her name was Heket, I think how you pronounce it. Heket, and she had a frog head, yeah? So what you're saying is, they saw these things, you weren't allowed to kill the frogs, because it would have been seen as an um, awful thing to do, to kill one of these things, which was, was, was a symbol of fertility and things like this. So what did God do? He then all of a sudden, not only brought forth the frogs, but he also, they all died. So all of these sacred frogs ended up in big piles, big heaps, and you can imagine the, the smell and all sorts of that. So that's God's second judgment. Number three, gnats. The, who likes gnats? I don't think anyone in the world likes gnats, or like mosquitoes. No, gnats are like things like parasites. They're parasites. No one likes gnats, do they? But apparently, folks, yeah, what do you Oh, very good. All right. Scout's mum's called Nat. Yeah, but not that Nat. Not that Nat. She's, she, she's not um, a horrible Nat that goes around biting people. So. I hope not, anyway. Thank you for that, Scout. Nats! Horrible things. Some people were allergic to them. You can imagine uh, people that were coming out with all sorts of rashes and stuff like that. But this was an attack on the false god Set, which was a god of the, of the desert, in a sense. So you can see he was just showing him up. Okay, fourth one is flies. Now this is an interesting one, because in the Septuagint, which is a, uh, the, where, where the Old Testament was translated into Greek, um, what, what it was it called, they translated it as something like a horse fly. Has anyone know, has anyone seen a horse fly? Another one, I think they're called bot flies, aren't they? Something like that. They are horrific. They make this horrible one, and they sting. Horrible sting, and you come out and it's big. You get them down the farms and that, they're always around, always around horses. But you can imagine, I mean, you can see Pharaoh there, I know, that the stings, they would have come out with all these big blisters and that, they would have been awful. But this was an attack on uh, the god uh, Uachit. I know that probably means nothing to you, but this was showing him up, alright? And does anyone know what the next plague is? Animals. Or livestock, or domesticated animals, yeah? Not, probably not the wild ones. This would have been the animals that they had, the flocks and stuff like that, yeah? But we see, 
It, we'll see about the protection in a minute. God protected his people, so they kept, they kept their flocks, yeah? And even uh, what happened is Pharaoh sent spies to go and check to see if the Hebrews' uh, animals had died, and he confirmed that, right? But this was uh, an attack on the god Sekhmet, Sekhmet, right? Which was the god who brought epidemics and also ended them. So you can see God has shown his power over this god as well. We'll work through this quite quickly. Uh, boils! When you get one boil, that's enough, isn't it? It's horrific. These people were covered in boils. Covered in boils, yeah? And um, the next one, hail and fire. We can see that, you can imagine in, in, in the Egyptian time, rain was very rare, yeah? And they worshipped the, the goddess called Nut, who was the sky goddess. Yeah, so you can imagine when these massive bits of hail were coming down. And not only that, what they were doing is they would destroy, they would have come down and smashed all these monuments, monuments, defaced all of these false gods. You can see God in his, in his wrath, he's coming down and he's destroying this god, okay? Um, the sky goddess nut. Locusts. Now this is an interesting one. Um, so we do get epidemic of locusts today. There was somewhere in Africa, I think it was in 1926, um, in, um, in part of Africa. And it, apparently over the space of 14 years, it destroyed something like 1.5 million um, square miles of, of vegetation. And it's horrific. But what they used to do, they would, use, they would wear ambulance to ward off, um, to ward off the locusts. So God is showing his power over this God, which uh, I'm not sure what God that is, but it was some sort of worship and the power over their eminence. Now, does anyone know what the next one is? This is the first, last one before the first one. That's a good picture, isn't it? It's not as dark as I would hope. <laughs> darkness. And this is an awful one, because this was a darkness that was felt. Yeah, and it said that though they couldn't even move until it was gone. This was an awful thing, you could feel it. I mean, imagine feeling a darkness. I think it's the same darkness um, used in other parts of scripture, but it's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. Now this was an attack on the god Ra. Yeah, or Horus, the sun god, which actually Pharaoh used to, uh, uh, they would say he was the reincarnation of this god, okay? And Ra, the sun god Ra would, would be the one who provided light, provided warmth, um, and provided life. And then so you can see God is showing his power over the sun god Ra. But not only that, he's showing his power over Pharaoh. Because if Pharaoh is the reincarnation of sun god Ra, he's been completely shown up here. Uh, you know the last one? The death of the firstborn. This is a horrific one. Um, if you can imagine, the firstborn of every household would have been inherited the family and all the money and all sorts of their belongings after that. So they really relied on their firstborn so they could transfer all their family and inheritance down to them. So you can understand, it says that there was a lot of wailing going on. So you can imagine the whole of Egypt when these firstborn died, there was wailing and crying. And it would have been an awful thing. Okay, so that's the last play. But what is the purpose of this? God is showing his power to the Egyptians, that he has power over all of these false gods. Yeah? And God still shows us that power today. Do you agree with that? So we're going to go to some scripture now. This is a very famous one, you all know this, Romans 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God made it plain to them. How did he make it plain? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. So creation itself speaks of power. Because God breathed life into the world, he created it. So that, sh that shows God's power, but we can also see God's power uh, in, in many other things. So that same power 
that God is using here. It says here, listen to this scripture. And what is exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Now, if you read the first chapter of Ephesians, it tells us all the spiritual blessings that we get. Yeah, that we're chosen, that we're adopted, that we are, um, it's by grace and saying that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and all this stuff, yeah? But it's the power, this is his exceeding power towards us that changes, yeah? To all those believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. This is the, the Satan's, um, should I say, his army. Yeah, different structures of his army. God is far above all this, yeah? And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ages which to come. So Christ, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is working in us. Yeah? And that's the gospel. It's the gospel that is the... Power unto salvation, yeah? It's the gospel that's the power. Okay. So also, so it's shown the power, right, uh, of, of just displaying all these plagues, but he shows the power that he works in us. But he also shows the power over the darkness and dark arts, which you'll be seeing, which Graham mentioned last week. Do you remember the magicians? They weren't using tricks. They were using some sort of occultic power. Yeah, uh, uh, to try and match. You know when he threw the snake down, they could replicate that. And then what happened? <laughs> Moses' snake ate the two snakes up. But after that, there was the Nile. They were able to do that. And they were able to replicate frogs as well. It's funny, isn't it? That they're, they're seeing all these things, but then what do they do? They make more. I think that's weird. You'd think they would say, okay, look, we're going to try and take them away. But they're making it worse for themselves. I can't get my head around that one, but that's funny. They added to the problem. But you can see the magicians, when, they, uh, when God sent the plague of boils, the magicians couldn't even get out of bed to get to the palace. And with that, they couldn't even stand. That's what the Bible says. So uh, you know that uh, just from the gnats, they said, okay, look, we can't replicate this. This is from the what? The finger of God. Now, I think that's interesting. The finger of God, just his finger, I'd say little finger, just his little finger is more powerful than Satan and all his hosts. I love that. Just his finger. So it's the finger of God. You, you remember last week we said uh, where uh, Jesus uh, was uh, chatting with the Pharisees and they accused him of casting out devils by what? By Beelzebub. So he was casting out devils by Satan. And Jesus says, well look, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then surely the finger of God is upon you. So we can see his finger has all power to cast out their demons. And that's the time where these two kingdoms are manifest. Where Jesus just says, get out. And they come out and they have to obey him. That's the finger of God. Power, more powerful than any demon. More powerful than any fallen angel. More powerful than, than Satan himself. No problem. No problem. Now, in um, the Gospels it says Jesus was out healing. He was out teaching. He was out preaching the Gospel. And he saw the crowd and he had compassion on them. He said, they look like a sheep without a shepherd. Yeah? So he said, the harvest is plentiful. And this is what he did afterwards. He called the disciples to himself. Yeah? And what did he do? He gave them authority. Yeah? Authority to heal all diseases and to cast out demons. So you can see that authority, that power. I think of, um, there is a, I mentioned this before, there was this uh, ex-satanic witch named Doreen Irvine. Do you remember her? Has anyone seen her testimony? Yeah. It's, it's quite powerful. Now it says that when she, when she got saved, apparently she had 47 demons cast out. That's all that uh, idolatry, all that false worship, all that occult stuff that she's been into, which is absolutely horrific. Okay, um, we can see that from Exodus 20. Oh, here, let's read this. I'll read it to you. In 1968, while conducting the church anniversary service in a city suburb, I was deeply moved and greatly encouraged to see in the congregation a woman I had met since her deliverance from 47 demons three years previously. This was a pastor of the church. She was once a prostitute, a heroin addict, a witch, a satanist, and a victim of abominable practices. 
Here she was now radiant with the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's awesome, isn't it? She's radiant with the glory of the Lord and rejoicing in Him. It wasn't by chance that they were singing that song, and can it be? Long my prison spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickly ray, I woke the dungeon flame with light. That's a lovely this. My chains fell off, and I was free. I rose, went forth, and followed ye, followed, followed Christ. I love that. I love that. That is just absolutely awesome. But you can see these chains that held Dory Irvine. She was getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And that power, Christ comes along the gospel, and it, and it just changes her, radically changes her. But what, one thing she said this, she said, I had no power over a Christian. We tried to do all sorts of things to, to curse them, but they were covered in what? The blood. The blood of Christ. She said, but when I received the Holy Spirit, there was a clean power that came into me. A clean, pure power. That's a lovely, isn't it? That's wonderful. Let's move on. Um, so that's it. He has a purpose that all may know him. He has power, and he shows that power in his place and the power to change your life. But also, he has the power to protect his people. Yeah, we know... Uh, he said, I'll make a distinction between you and the Egyptians. We know the horse flies. He made a distinction between them because they didn't get bitten. Thankfully for that. Um, the livestock, he made a distinction because their flocks were not harmed. And interestingly enough, when they left Egypt, Pharaoh tried to say, hey, just leave them behind. But God, Moses says, no way, we're taking them. We have to sacrifice them to the Lord. So they had all their flocks come with them out of Egypt. That's amazing. We see the hail. Israel feared the word of the Lord, it says. So they came in, they brought all their animals and, and their people inside. So when the hail came, they survived. But interestingly enough, the officials, there are some of the Pharaoh's officials that obeyed. And what they did is they brought their people in and their livestock and it didn't touch. I think this is interesting, isn't it? That God's arm reaches out to the Egyptians. If Egyptians are a symbol of the world, God's arm reaches out to everyone. I desire that none perish, Bible says, but that all come to the knowledge of the truth. You see that. So, the other thing that God protects them from is darkness. I love this. When the Egyptians were, uh, they couldn't move, they were stuck on the floor, they couldn't see anything, they could feel this darkness. Yet the Israelites, it says that they had light in the places where they stayed. So you could see this light just emanating out of their holes. I wonder if they could see that in the distance. You know, it's absolutely amazing. But that's what Jesus said. He said, "You are the light of the world." Believe it or not, Jesus is the light of the world, but so are you. He said, "A city on a hill cannot be hidden." Yeah. And he said, "So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven." Yes. Yeah, so you're a light, and your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Aren't you being a light for God? Jerry, I'm glad you're sitting here. We, we've got to be a light in all we do. We've got to shine. Jesus has got to shine out of us. When people look at you, do they see Jesus? I know, I, I, in that little speaker in the toilet in the church, it says, uh, is it WWJD? I thought, what does that mean? And then it says, oh, then what would Jesus do? But obviously, to know what Jesus would do, you have to what? You have to read the Bible. You can't say, oh, I, I just do what Jesus does, because if you don't read that, Jesus could do anything, couldn't he? if you didn't read the word. So it's very important. Are you being a light? Now it's interesting, God protects his people, but we see this last play, this, uh, the, called the Passover. Now, he protects his own people, yeah? But this time, his people, there was a, a, an act of faith required, yeah? Um, the last play required action, the death of the firstborn. So this is God's plan. This is his foreknowledge, yeah, of what's going to happen in the future. Now, it's true that 100% of people in this world are going to die. Do you agree with me? Yeah. I don't think there's anyone who escapes death. Not one person. And the Bible says, no. for the wages of sin is death. Now that verse is quite scary in reading on its own. A lot of preachers use that out in the streets. Wages of sin is death. But they forget the next bit. You say it with me. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Don't use them separately. Use them together. Because obviously you've got do, but then hope, and 
and that's Jesus, right? So we can see death. And Christ, judgment is coming. Either when you die, you're going to stand before the Lord, or Jesus is going to come back, one of the two. Now, interestingly, being christened as a child, is that going to get you saved? Okay? Is going to church going to get you saved? The most people I talk to throughout the week, I say, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you, has anyone told you the gospel? I'm like, how are you going to church? Yeah, but do you know Jesus? Well, well I go to church, but this can't get out. So, not to bring them down or anything, but that's not going to cut it. No amount of good works is going to get you saved. Just like these Hebrews, yeah? If they would have just trusted in their own identity, would they have got them saved? No. It required an act of faith, and what did they have to do? They had to kill a lamb, firstborn lamb, spotless, yeah? So four days, uh, they kill a lamb, and then what they had to do, dip the blood in his hand, you this probably the pass over there, put it on the doorpost and the lid. Interestingly enough, it's the symbol of the cross, which is Jesus Christ being our um, Passover lamb. So in order for you in the future, or for now, for death to pass over you, what do you do? You have to be covered in the blood of Christ. And that only takes an act of faith by saying, I believe in Jesus and I trust in his work, what he's done on the cross. Okay? So that's the fourth. He has a plan for you, which is the Passover. Um, interestingly enough, we get a little teaching, I think it's in Exodus 12, just on from that. It tells them what they have to do now, the Jews. And you know they're not allowed any leaven. Why is that? Because they had to leave in a hurry and they left the leaven behind. Yeah? So you can see God here has his sovereign hand over that. And what they had to do, so some of the kids would find the leaven. They would make little games for them. So they would find the leaven, make sure that they had none left. So they had to get out of their homes. All right? And then they had to select a lamb. Four days before Passover, they had to make sure it was spotless. Okay? Yeah? And then they had to kill it and then eat it. That's Passover. That's what uh, God said they had to do. But Leo, uh, when Jesus on the triumphal entry, yeah, this is God sending his own lamb. Did you know that was four days before Passover, which was called Lamb Selection Day? God brought his own lamb in. And we can see that he went through false trial after false trial. And then they couldn't find any fault with him. Even Pilate washed his hands. He says, I find no fault with this lamb. So you can see that Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God. And we can see on that time, I, I, I did this in the church, but there was a time where the sacrifices were being made. And also the, the, the men of the house would have killed that Passover meal about twilight and Jesus was out on the cross. And he said, it's finished. I am the Passover Lamb. That's, that's what Christ is. He is the Passover Lamb. And in 1 Corinthians, I think it is, I think I've got it. So there's the part, sorry, I'm not keeping up with my, my point here. There's the Passover, that's what they had to do by the blood. We have to do the same by an act of faith. We don't have to do that anymore. We just have to believe and trust in Jesus, yes? Yeah? This is the, I'm going to close on this actually, because uh, I went on quite a lot of times. Get rid of the old yeast. Before that, I said a little leaven, leaven's a whole lot, yeah? Get rid of the whole yeast. So this is what the kids used to have to do, they do and, and the families had to get rid of all the yeast. Um, so that you may be a new unleavened batch. And how important it is that us as Christians, that we put sin to death. Yeah? We follow Christ and we try, we try to serve him, we try to obey him. This is what we do. Get rid of the unleavened. As you really are, here we go, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Yeah? And Jesus Christ is our sacrifice once and for all, it says in Hebrews 10. Once and for all, Jesus has done it all. Yeah, there's nothing else that needs to be done. What do you have to do? Believe. Believe. Believe in Him. Repent of your sin. Trust in Him. Now, obviously, uh, you can't put all your sin away. But you come to Him and acknowledge your sin, yeah, and He will help you clean up your life. Yeah? So that's it. So first, let's go through these quickly to end. We have a purpose, and that's uh, God wants you to know Him. I think that's lovely. God of the world. God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He wants to have a relationship with you. Two power. He's displayed his power in creation, in his Bible, in the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. Number three, protection. He protects his people. He provides for his people. And number four, he has a plan for you. Yeah? He has a plan for each and every one of you. But first, you have to come to him. Yeah? Come to him and believe that he is who he says he is. 
And when we enter into glory, God will pass over us and we will have Christ's righteousness. Do you understand that? Have you got any questions? I'm going to say a prayer. So right. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the wonderful display of power in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus, Lord. And all throughout the scripture, Lord, you're, you're, you're declaring your wonders. You want people to declare your wonders. What you did, especially in the next session, we'll be talking about the parting of the Red Sea. Who could do that, Lord? No one could do that. And Lord, we just pray, Father, for your word that it would sink in us, Lord, that Christ has done it all. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen.